Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to Building Next Gen Fire Apps. My name is Shane O'Neill. Um, I work here at Asymmetric, um, and I've been here for about a year now, um, and I specialize in making fire servers and fire apps. Uh, let's go. So I just want to give a little bit of an agenda for today. Uh, I'm going to start with um, with an introduction of Asymmetric, who we are. I'm going to review FIRE just because I don't know exactly where everyone is uh, in their skill level with FIRE. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about SMART, um, the SMART on FIRE protocol for launching FIRE apps. And then once we get that out of the way, we can uh, code some, some cool apps um, using uh, a template project called FIRE App Starter. So Asymmetrics about 100 employees out of Annapolis Junction, Maryland, and we specialize in systems interoperability, HIPAA compliance, data analytics, and user experience optimizations. Our enterprise healthcare solutions and services help hospitals and providers uh, reduce their costs and provide a better uh, quality of care. Uh, when it comes to fire, we kind of have our hands in everything, um, whether that's fire servers, fire apps, or even CDS hooks, which is an emerging specification. Uh, today, we're just going to do fire apps, though. So open source. Um, we're a big proponent of open source. And recently, we've been putting a lot of different projects on our asymmetric GitHub. Um, I definitely encourage you to check these out. There's uh, server examples. And um, there's uh, two fire starter applications. And we developers, we love our uh, boilerplate taken care of for us. So definitely check those out. And we're going to be working with uh, the fire app starter for this for, for, for today. Right, so what is fire? Uh, fire is a lot of fun to say. You'll hear it pretty much everywhere in healthcare, people saying fire, um, but it actually is an acronym, believe it or not. Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. Now, what does this mean? Interoperability resources basically means digital representations of things in healthcare. So for example, a patient has a fire resource, a fire representation, um, a, a laboratory reading, or even a device like a Fitbit has a corresponding, well, not exactly a Fitbit, but it would have a device uh, fire resource. And essentially with these rigidly defined, anyone that is speaking fire, I know what they're talking about when they say observation or condition. My programs that I write will be able to understand their programs if we're exchanging fire resources. Um, and that's essentially what an API specification is at its core. Fire is just a list of rules and features that you should implement um, to be fire compliant. Um, right. So fire is also JSON. It's typically represented in JSON. It can also be represented in XML, but uh, a lot of developers out there prefer JSON. Um, and with that, uh, we can exchange exchange uh, JSON documents and um, and build really cool applications on on top of the. Uh, JSON payloads and things like that. Uh, Fire's HTTP, which um, also gives us uh, a lot of REST capability. So we're kind of borrowing from a, a, another paradigm there. It's not completely reinventing the wheel. So all of our verbs, put, get, post, delete, patch, they all have corresponding uh, places in Fire where they're used. And Fire is the real deal. It's really being adopted by industry leaders um, due to being mandated by the 21st Century Cures Act um, there's a clause about inter interoperability and um, being able to retrieve your data. So um, it's here to stay and it's going to continue forward. There's lots of different um, healthcare systems like Cerner and Epic that are really building out their fire capabilities right now. Okay, so I said we would, uh, so that's fire. I said we would review Smart on Fire, so I'm going to do that now as well. Um, if you have any questions while I go through this, make sure you save them, write them down, not just this part, but any part for today, make sure you save them, write them down. Um, I'll answer all of them in the chat after this is over. So, uh, let me get this going real quick. Okay. So this is just a, a drawing pad, um, that I have, and I'm going to draw out the smart on fire protocol so that everyone knows really what makes uh, smart on fire apps unique. Um, let me get black. 
So there's a few different players in this handshake. There's the EHR. This is where your health records are stored. And this is where your doctor will put things in like um, your blood pressure, your weight, um, any conditions that you have, but basically anything about you. We also have an auth server that exists somewhere for security. And then we have the fire server. And this holds our fire resources. And of course we have our app. So the flow basically goes like this. The EHR will call us on a launch route, typically launch.html. And it will include some kind of state with it. Then the app goes out to the auth server and it goes out to, um, it goes out to it with its state that it was it received from the launch and it receives a token. And then with that token, we can finally go out to the fire server. There's some other things that happen in this. This is a much simpler representation, but um, you typically don't need to worry about that for today. Um, if you want to learn more about the Smart on Fire handshake, then you can definitely go on the official box and read about it. Um, okay. So yes, Smart on Fire apps, Smart apps, Fire apps, these are all the same things and they're definitely unique. And we have to keep that in mind as developers. So as a developer, I'm moving over to GitHub right now to show you some examples to Fire apps. Um, as a developer, you typically, whenever you're developing an app, you always Google for examples. You want to know how other people are coding theirs and what kind of designs they're doing and things like that. And there's tons of great Fire apps out there. Um, here's a page full of them on, on GitHub. And I use these all the time to test Fire servers. Uh, this is one, this one's my favorite, um, just because it, it offers such a um, simplified view of the handshake. And we can even see the launch.html going back to the authorization server with its scopes, um, with its state, and the index receiving that and getting the auth token back. It's all really good stuff. Um, the only problem with simplified examples like this is that they tend not to offer the developer experience that modern developers are used to. Um, especially with client-side applications, modern developers and the developer experience has grown to kind of favor um, the big three front-end frameworks. And that means React, Vue, or Angular. Um, so we've recently released a, a Fire App Starter project that um, is actually based on React, but it keeps the fundamentals in a lot of these starters the same. So it's, it's kind of like a merger. You get your fundamentals that you're used to with the handshake, but you also get the developer experience you, you're expecting. And we're going to use this today. So I'm going to pull up a terminal and clone this right now. So we'll move into projects, git clone, fire app starter. We'll call it fire webinar. Cool. So this is VS Code. Yours might look a little bit different um, depending on your color scheme and things like that. I'll pull up a terminal here and do a yarn install. Because this uh, includes React, we're also going to be including Webpack, um, Babel for transpiling. Um, we're going to pull in a lot of ESLint stuff. Um, prettier and a lot of the kind of boilerplate that pro uh, projects are kind of used to or developers are used to. Um, so after we're done installing, we can start it up. Yep. So while this is starting, I'll talk a little bit about this project um, and why I'm so excited to share it with you. So what this is doing is it's building our launch.html what we talked about earlier, and um, our index.html with the uh, config values that modern EHRs are expecting to see. So from the perspective of the EHR, this is just any other application. Um, and 
we're going to actually go into Cerner's Code Sandbox and make an application and launch this. So this is still starting up. So this is what it looks like when you start it up with, um, uh, with, without launching from an EHR. It just has a little bit of information about the project and um, a notification that you're not connected to an EHR. So Cerner has a really great developer environment and this is what I use to develop uh, Fire Apps and I definitely encourage you to check it out. Um, it has, they have a lot of documentation and basically everything that I've talked about so far, they have great documentation on it if you wanna learn more. Um, so I'm gonna go into the code console and we're gonna register a new application. So I'll call this Fire Webinar. Now it needs to know, the HR needs to know where we're gonna launch from. So we know where we're gonna launch from. That's gonna be localhost 3000 slash launch.html. And then it needs to know after we launch, where am I going to give the token response to? Where's your app located essentially? And that's gonna be on the root. Um, we're gonna select provider for this example. We're gonna do DSU2. Uh, because that's the most mature I think they have. R4 is, is newer, so I'm more familiar with the SU2. Uh, authorized, yep. Uh, and now scopes. Scopes are very important to understand when building fire apps. Scopes are basically saying, when I get my token response, what do I want that token response authorized against? So it's important to be responsible and only choose which scopes your app needs. Um, I could be, you know, lazy and just select everything, not knowing what I need until I, um, until I'm ready. But if you're ever moving to um, a production system, you you want to narrow down your scopes to only what you need. So for this example, I'm only going to need condition and patient, maybe observation. So your smart app, Fire Webinar, is registered. There's the client ID. Great. Uh, Fire Webinar. So this lists very important application information that our launch.html and our index are going to need in order to complete the Smart on Fire handshake. And that's client ID um, and redirect URI and, of course, the Fire server that we're going to be launching against. So I'm gonna move this over to the right and I'm gonna move our code over to the left. So Fire App Starter has um, a config file for smart information called smart.js. So if I do a search for smart.js, it'll open right there. And we can see that um, these are just empty strings that we're now going to fill out. So let's fill them out now. I'm gonna copy my client ID over um, and the redirect URI. And um, the ISS. And the scopes. Scopes have a particular syntax. Um, it goes like this. It'll be patient because we selected patient scopes and then it'll be the resource. And then it'll be either write or read. And we can also do condition.read, um, and I think we wanted observation. Cool. So we'll stop our Webpack dev server and we'll restart it so that it gets built with the new information. Cool, so nothing changed. Um, and that's because we didn't launch from an EHR. So we're gonna play the role of the EHR using their code sandbox. Um, think of us as a provider opening up a patient 
inside their dashboard to view information about them. Um, so we can do that by begin testing and Cerner gives a bunch of uh, example patients to choose from. Uh, some of these have tons of information against them. And um, if you use this sandbox, you'll get familiar with most of them. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna select Anders just because I know what kind of information he has. Oh, the client ID is wrong. Uh, sometimes it takes a moment in Cerner system to update when you make a new app. It wouldn't be a live demo without something going wrong. <laughs> I think, I think it, sometimes it just takes a moment. Try Anders again. try rebuilding. Um, if not, we can always just use one that's already created. Okay, we're going to switch over to an app that I know is already created. <laughs> um, and that's test. So we're going to move this client ID here and um, the ISS is the same and we'll rebuild. Cool, let's try testing it again. Ponders. There we go. So yeah, if you're registering an app on code uh, on code Cerner, then um, probably need to give it five minutes after making a new app for it to propagate, I guess. Um, so this is what the app looks like when it's properly connected. We've got a patient ID back and a user ID. Um, this is basically me, and this is the patient I uh, opened up. That's their ID. Cool. So we're going to actually write a new feature. Um, we're going to query the fire server for Anders' conditions, and we're going to render them out in a nice little table. So let's do that now. So fire app starter is organized in a way of containers, and each container contains everything that they need to do to interact with the Redux store. So if any of you aren't familiar with the Redux, it's a popular library for storing global state for React apps. Uh, think of it as like a database for your client-side app. So we're gonna do this in the home uh, component and you can see the home component is here. Uh, that's a little too big. From home component. And it makes requests through a library called Redux Saga, and this is how it's loading the patient information. So Redux Saga, like Redux, is a popular library that is in the kind of Re uh, React ecosystem. Um, there's a few different ones that serve the same purpose, like Redux Thunk, but this one is what I found to be the most popular and most powerful. It's mostly used for making asynchronous calls um, and one of the most popular asynchronous actions you can do is an API call. So that's what most people use it for, but it can be done, it can be used for a variety of flow controls and it's pretty complex and powerful. Uh, this is a special syntax that uh, the JavaScript developers watching might not be familiar with. Um, this is JavaScript generators. Um, they're uh, not very common in everyday programming, but they are uh, the solution that Redux Saga has right here is a very clever implementation and use of uh, generators. Uh, essentially think of it as um, you're going to dispatch um, things that you want done and Redux Saga is going to do them and then give your generator the output of that function. So if I'm making an API call, I'm going to yield, hey, I want to make an API call 
it's going to make that API call on my behalf and then give my function, my generator, the uh, result of that call in the next iteration, the next call. Um, so almost if you want in your head to translate this to every time you see a yield call, you could almost think of that as an async await. Okay, cool. So we have our fire client here and we've already making, we're already making calls to patient to read the patient. So let's also make a call to read their conditions. So I'm going to do conditions equals yield call. Um, now I, in my brain, it makes the most sense to wrap this. So I'm going to make a quick wrapper function up here and it's going to take the client. My keyboard likes to double press. I'm not sure why it's going to take a query. Um, and it's going to return client dot request the query, and then I'm going to give it some arguments, including a page limit, just for the sake of the demo to not get too much test data. And I'm also going to give it an argument called uh, flat. If you guys aren't familiar with the JavaScript Fire Client, it's also an open source library. And I think it's like the first result if you Google uh, Fire Client JS. Um, and it has a, a lot of different things. Flat basically uh, does some unpacking of the resulting bundle for us um, to make things a little simpler. So let's actually use this function in a, a, a Redux Saga call now. So we're going to call our wrapper and the arguments that we're going to give it are the client, of course, and we're going to give it a query. And it's going to be condition, condition, patient equals, and then we're going to put in the patient.id. And we also are going to give it another parameter called clinical status active, because we only really want the active conditions. Your, your business requirements might want other conditions. Um, so now that we have the conditions in our saga, we want to move them to the Redux store. So to do that, we're going to, we're going to yield a put. I'll yield put. Now, if I was doing this um, in the event of a upcoming code review, I would obviously move these, um, what I'm going to put in here to a uh, Redux action creator. But for this example, I'm just going to do it in line. So to not confuse you with jumping to a different, a bunch of different files. So Redux actions take type and I'm going to call this a uh, condition success and it takes a payload or basically whatever you want to put in. Um, and we're going to give that conditions. Now, in classic Redux fashion, uh, fashion we're going to need to reduce the output of this put. So I'm going to open up my reducer. And, and this is what I, this is the great thing I like about this startup, uh, this startup starter project. Uh, you kind of can just go by the design patterns that are already there and you don't really need to reinvent the wheel that much. So I can see this is where, you know, patient information gets put in the store. So it's a pretty good spot to put my condition to. So I'm going to name this, uh, I'm going to create a new case, which is the exact same name that I did as the type to my action condition success. I think that's what I said, right? Condition success. And I'm going to do draft dot condition equal action dot payload. Cool. So now when this launches, this should be in the Redux store. And even we can even check if it is, if um, we go to our dev tools. The cool thing about um, having the Webpack dev server running is you get all of your dev tools as well. So we can look in the home component. This might be a little small for you, but I can see all of our conditions are actually loaded into the Redux store. And that's probably the hardest part. So we're doing well. So now we can render them on the screen in a nice fashion. Um, so here's our home component. This is what we see down here, the hello from home container. And it has a Redux hook called maps date. Well, not a, not a Redux hook in the Redux hook sense, but um, a function called map state the props. 
Um, and this is where you can pull things out of the Redux store, pull your, pull your fire resources out of the Redux store and stick them in the global Redux state. And we can do that with, for conditions, kind of following the same pattern to our left there, patient is, is also getting pulled out of the state. Um, so conditions. We know where we put it. We put it in state.home.conditions in our reducer in our reducer. And we should have it in our render function now. So if we do const conditions equal this.props, some object unpacking there, we'll be able to work with conditions like any other prop. And and this is, this is all the hard parts are essentially behind us now. Now we can get as creative as we want with JSX and making these look as cool and as pretty as we want. Um, it's important to remember that we're working with async pro uh, processes. So this, th this condition might still be undefined. So if we don't have conditions, we wanna make sure that we return something like I'm loading or something like that. I named it condition, not conditions. So this should be conditions too. Okay, cool. Um, so if we refresh our app here on the right, we can see it, it's loading for a few seconds, fetching resources from the fire server, and then it's not. So that means we have them. So let's render these in a nice way, just to, just to show them off. Uh, I'm gonna make another grid.row and inside that, I'm gonna make a cell to table. Now I'm gonna use semantic UI to render these just so I don't have to worry about um, CSS. Uh, their, their tables are pretty pretty, uh, are pretty, pretty cool. Uh, I like this framework a lot. Um, I'm gonna put a header in the table. I'm also going to put a body. And inside the header, I'm gonna put one row and inside that, I'm going to put, uh, whoops, not another table. Table dot header cell. We'll put two header cells and we're gonna name one condition and one code. Let's see what this looks like. Loading, maybe we're not fetching patients. Maybe we need to, oh, we probably need to relaunch because the session's gone on too long. Let's, let's relaunch. So while it's loading, I'm gonna keep coding here on the left. In the table body, um, oh, these have to be, Uh, on separate rows, I think. Oh, no, th this looks good. Um, let's continue. Conditions uh, dot filter. We want to filter out some of the conditions from Cerner's code sandbox that are um, not as well formed. So sometimes, sometimes they have conditions in there that don't have proper codings. So I'm going to filter those out. Um, every condition is going to re require a coding for me for my personal uh, application here. If you are moving to production, you probably want to, would want to address why conditions don't have codings. Um, and then I'm going to map them to um, JSX. So we're going to return condition, and we want to return some JSX here. I'm going to return a table.row. And inside that, I'm going to return two cells. The first one is going to be, um, Whoops, in brackets. The first one's going to be the display, which is located at the first element of the coding. And the second one's going to be the, the actual code. So we can see that too. Let's see what this looks like as it refreshes. Cool, so there's our conditions. We have our condition and codes um, all listed. And we can see that they have a bunch of different um, disorders, fake disorders, essentially. Um, 
And you could definitely think of a prettier way to put this. And I definitely encourage you to, uh, to clone the Fire App Starter and, and get creative with your React. Um, so that's about it for the feature that I wanted to create with you guys. And um, I will move to some questions. So before I look at the chat, um, I have here a list of unique uh, or useful links, um, including the link to the starter project that was featured today, and um, also a link to the Smart on Fire uh, documentation and Cerner's Code Sandbox. Um, I'm on GitHub all the time, so if you find anything wrong with uh, any of our issue, uh, any of our projects, then definitely feel free to raise an issue, and uh, you'll hear back from me right away. OK. So if anyone has any questions, um, definitely post them in the chat. If you can't think of any questions, um, then feel free to email us at fire.asymmetric.com when you do have any questions. And that about wraps it up then. Thanks, everyone.